again project to project it will vary a bit but uh, like uh, major, majorly like you will get uh, this many component only mostly you will get these components but still again project to project uh, structure will vary a bit so first thing like uh, you will have some detail about this functional design document like for which project this one and what kind of functionality you are going to cover here okay so this one is let's say this one is for retail domain as i mentioned this particular module is suitable for multiple domain okay but i am taking reference as a retail one okay and let's say this website for like this this particular document for client or project this and then line of business like uh, who is going to consume this kind of like this api so customers are going to consume okay and then there will be some initial high level detail for this particular document so how we will follow this versioning then what kind of uh, details we have in this document what all standards you need to follow so all those kind of document instruction are here then like in this document what all major things we have covered like overview and then functional and application specification we have given here okay now so this part let me delete first let's uh, let's assume like i am architect and i i am doing like meetings with client and i am collecting all the requirement okay so what i will do first i will create one initial draft of this document okay so in initial draft whatever detail i will get i will put everything here okay and then like someone will review that document and let's say client will review this document and if they will have any feedback so what they will do they will write their feedback here so what he will do he will put version as a 1.1 and date let's say and So like my customer is not clear with the mapping of this email address, how email address is getting mapped. Okay. So other comment, like let's say he has any other comment. this kind of like uh, review comment he will write then again i once i will get all the review comment i will incorporate all the review comment and i will put as a 1.2 This one was there in customer information, so I updated. This is already there, and it's in in this particular section. Okay.
and then target system what they want to update i updated that one now so after all this review commit so we will have another set of meeting so there i will start implement like adding new things so again now it will start from 2.0 Okay, like that we added new requirements. So in this way, we, we maintain this change history. So anyone can go through this change history and they will easily able to understand what kind of like uh, document started, who did change, what time they did change, who reviewed this document, who incorporated review comment, all this kind of detail they will get here and this will keep adding. Okay. Then here, ownership and responsibility who created this one so mulesoft architect and what is name of that person developer guide okay same way like uh, documentation like uh, who all are doing review for this one so it project manager business analyst solution architect all these members are doing and name is not decided yet so i mentioned tbd there will be some name like mr abc pq or something will be there okay then this table of content like whenever you will keep updating content here you you can easily like update this table of content so what you need to do just uh, click on this and then update table it will ask you you want okay it's it will ask you update page number only or update entire table so update entire table will update this table okay so whatever you will keep adding here based on that it, it, it's keep updating okay now here you need to write business overview so for which purpose uh, like uh, you are going to create this document what all business requirement you will have so high level you need to write business overview okay then business benefit like what and how this api is going to provide benefit to business then so like uh, overview of this particular like list of api so here, how many services you are going to for this particular functionality? How many services will be there? So you will keep adding all the services. Services means API. What all API will be part of this particular business functionality? Since this is functional design document, so you need to tell them what all API will be part of this functionality. OK, so let's say. So this many API will be there. So we'll keep adding services here. Okay. And then we need to define, okay, then functional dependency. If we have any functional dependency or constraints, so you need to highlight all the constraints here. Only. If you are doing any kind of assumption, let's say uh, this is initial draft or like say you can say this like, uh, Customer detail it will be de delivered in to release. Okay, so you have here assumption like in some part of this customer detail will come in release to. So you need to give all the assumption here. Okay, so whatever assumption will be there, you need to keep here. So who all will be audience for this document? So there will be architect, project manager, PA analyst developers all those will be audience for this document so you will mention it. 
OK. Now here you can see we have this three layer architecture. API landscape diagram I have created. So in this particular project also we are going to follow this API. Like a three layer architecture only where we will have experience API, process API and system API. So this system API will interact with external system like Salesforce database. In our case, we will have Salesforce database. Then uh, this uh, VMQ third party API. All those external system we will have for this particular project. So whatever system API will be there, that system API will interact with all those external system. Then we will have process API where we will apply all the business logic. OK, so. This process API will be intermediate in between experience and system API also, and all the business logic will be implemented here. And then we will have this experience API, which will use to expose our API to external world. It can be a front end system, it can be any third party system. Okay. Now you will say, like uh, security policy wise, what all security policy we will keep on each layer. So in XPS layer, we are going to use OAuth. Okay, previously I had mostly I used this JWT token, but for this project I'm going to use OAuth. So here in this layer, mostly we will have OAuth policy. We will have client ID enforcement. We will have date limiting policy. So all this kind of policy we will have. In process layer, since this is like internal layer, we are only this mule application will will consume this API. So here we don't need any kind of OAuth or JWT token. It's not mandatory. If you want, you can keep. But only internal application is going to consume this, so we will apply only client ID enforcement. Okay, in process layer, and in system layer again, like uh, we are calling external system, there may be some limit for external system. So we may apply rate limiting policy, then client ID enforcement will be there. Caching may be there like when we are calling external system, if we are getting somewhat static response. So instead of calling that system again and again, what we can do, we can apply. Sorry, we can apply HTTP caching policy. So this this all three layer we have and we have this mobile application as a source target right now it's Salesforce, but we will have few more targets Salesforce start sorry database third party API and VMQ. Then like there will be one flow diagram also like uh, what all source and target system are involved, how they are interacting with each other, what all functionality are there. So all those things will come inside this flow diagram. OK, and then we'll have sequence diagram also. So previously I was using some other tool, DrawIO, but now like I, I, I've got one uh, some better tool. So I will show you like how that tool work, but uh, like once I will create one document, then I will share that tool details and all. OK, so this time we are going to use sequence type sequence diagram dot form. I think dot IO or something is there. So. If you use this uh, draw IO, then again we will have lots of like uh, if you want to do any kind of modi modification, then you need to do lots of adjustment and all. But if you will use sequence diagram, there is one uh, website. So there you can write all there you can write code for this diagram. OK, and if you will do in like if you need to do any change, you can directly do in change automatically. It will adjust the entire diagram. So that we will use and here you can see here in sequence diagram, it will tell the sequence of execution of each API. OK, let's say here this claim experience API is there, which is getting request here. And then this. You can see there is this uh, like uh, another line will start here. So once it will start its execution, this line will start. OK, so here we are calling this claim process API. So then claim process API will also start their execution. And it start its execution till this point. This process API is calling system API. So this system API will start its execution here and 
it it will complete its execution at this point. So here you can see it's getting ended here and sending response here. Once it will receive the response, it will send response back to this experience API. So from here we are sending response back. Okay, and then once this will complete, like we'll get response from process API, we'll do required processing, then it will send response back to front end system. So this sequence diagram will tell you order of execution. Okay. So which API is getting executed during which interval of time? Everyone clear with this three diagram, this API landscape diagram, flow diagram, and sequence diagram. If you have any query, let me know quickly. Okay, fine. So next, we will see like uh, how we'll create this. API detail like so here we started services. OK, our first service was get customer detail. OK, so for first service, we have experience API. So this particular like part we are creating where we will describe the experience API for this get customer detail. OK, so how you will create uh, detailed documentation for any API? So it will be very easy for developer. OK, so they will not keep asking multiple questions. So it's good to create everything document in proper way. OK, so let's say. We have this uh, customer detail experience API where like uh, you need to provide first resource details. So our resource will be. Customers, OK, as I mentioned earlier, like whatever resource name you are providing, that resource name should be plural and it should be now. OK, so we are going to. Work on customer part, so I given name as a customers version will be in your version. You can put 1.0.0. Or you can put like V1, anything should be fine. What will be method? So we are going to retrieve detail here. So method will be get. Okay, and this object description, this will retrieve. OK, so it will receive payment detail for this retail domain project. And system will be Salesforce system. OK, this one will be payment detail. Customer. Detail. OK, so if anyone has any doubt in this particular part, let me know. Arshit, do you have any query? Yes. Uh, can you hear yes. me? Yes, yes. So it's regarding the versioning. So we usually when we increase the version of an of a particular code. So there is this major minor patch. So uh, how do we decide whether we need to increase the major minor or a patch version? OK, yeah, so minor thing when like uh, whenever you are going to do any kind of review comment like 
so for example, you you are working on any project, OK? And you have release. Any any like uh, one release for that uh, particular application, OK? So you will do what you will start versioning with 1.0.0. OK, and then like you did everything, so you are keep increasing 1.0.0. 0, 1.0.1, 0. 0. 1.0.2, 1. like this, you are doing it, things. OK, now in future, if you found like uh, that uh, requirement, new requirement came and whatever previous requirement you have, like in version one, you want that feature also and you want new feature also. OK, so there is, you are going to do. Like a major change. You are going to do lots of change in your API, but you want your existing API also. So how you will identify like which one is older one and which one is latest one. So in that case, you will change your version from 1.0.0 to 2.0.0. OK. That 1.0.0 will be available with your previous services, previous capabilities and 2.0.0 will come with your new capabilities. OK, functionally there will be lots of difference, but you want like it's easy for you to track both the. Like uh, which one is older one and which one is newer one. If, if it is not clear, then let me know. I will explain again. OK, so you are talking about major version, right? What about the minor and patch ones? Yeah, minor one like as I mentioned, like uh, if you are doing, for example, you did some development. OK, now you ask someone to review your code. OK, after review comment incorporation, your version should not be same since you did some changes there. If any CR will come. OK, uh, CR means any small change request will come. So in that case also, you need to keep updating your version. So in that case also, you will do minor one only. Patch one I haven't seen. Uh, where exactly we use this patch one, but uh, mostly uh, like we do this uh, major and minor one. OK, OK, thanks. OK, and we, we must need to do this versioning and all. Otherwise, like it will be very difficult for you to identify like uh, which API need to call and which one is like a working one, which one like uh, Many many things will come okay, at this whenever you will start using any API. It's not like you will use six months and everything will be stopped. Okay. So it will go for five, six years also. After six years also, you will keep using the same API. Okay. So it's better to keep uh, proper to do proper versioning. And uh, sometime it may also happen. You have like you need your previous functionality also, and you need new functionality also. OK, in that case, this versioning will help a lot. OK, fine. Now, like uh, we we discuss about this uh, resource detail. As I mentioned, like whenever you discuss about any API or RAML, so first thing you need to define your resource. So in resource detail, you will provide all this detail. Now, second thing will be your input parameter. OK, so whenever you you discuss or you talk about any API input parameter, then in API we can pass input in four places. OK, first win first will be request. Oh, sorry. First one will be header. Second will be query parameter. Third will be URI parameter and then fourth one will be body. OK, now how you will identify which kind of data or which kind of request or input data we will pass in query parameter which kind of input data or request we will pass in URI parameter, what will pass in header and what will, will pass in body. If anyone want to answer, then you like you can answer quickly. Otherwise, I will explain. Anyone know like what kind of data we will pass in which input parameter? For the header, we pass in the transaction ID. For the query parameter as per the resource, we can pass query. For the, uh, uh, no, for uh, uh, for the URI parameter, we if you want to uh, pass the uh, unique one that is not filtering, and the body we can pass the uh, data. Uh, uh, that is a 
Yeah, that's it. Anyone else want to answer? And tokens, access token and API keys, such kind of things as input parameters. In input parameter, no. So we have four kind of input parameter. Header, query parameter, URI parameter, body. So what kind of data we will pass in which input parameter? So I think in body, we need to pass the request, uh, the payload, which you want to put it into the API. Uh, in query parameters, if we want to uh, like uh, get certain, uh, you know, certain filtered set of data, uh, like, uh, like filtering of a data we want. So we can pass that parameter in query parameter and we will get that result. In URI parameter, usually we get a group of results. And what was the last? Header. Headers is like in headers, like usually we pass, uh, you know, client ID, client secret, and some correlation IDs, something like that. So, so far, like uh, we got partial correct answer only. If anyone want to try, or should I proceed? <laughs> Okay, fine. So first thing, like uh, we have header. In header, generally we pass metadata. Okay. In header, we will not pass any processing or actual any any processing data or any filter condition. In header, we pass metadata. Now, what all things will come inside metadata? Metadata means it's not actual data. What we are doing, what we are processing, it's a supporting data for our processing data. Let's say, like uh, data. Uh, content type. So we are passing JSON data in our request payload. OK, so what is metadata for this? Content type application JSON is a metadata for this. OK, so in header, generally we pass metadata, then transaction ID. So transaction ID, whenever we are passing, that is not used for any processing purpose. It's used for logging purpose. It's used to support our mule application whenever we deploy to identify issue or anything. So we do logging and there we use this transaction ID. So transaction ID again, it's uh, like uh, metadata for our mule application. Then we have basic authentication, any OAuth policy or anything. Again, those kind of data we are not using for processing purpose. Those are we are using those data we are using only for securing our API. OK, so whenever we have any kind of metadata, we should pass inside header. OK, that's it. You can go on with it. Then second, we have query parameter. OK, if we want to. If we want to pass any filter conditions, OK, let's say uh, we are retrieving student detail and we want list of student who is scored more than 50 marks in math subject. OK, so here we are passing some filter condition marks. OK, or if I want to retrieve all the customer information who did purchase of more than 10,000 in a month. So here what we are passing, we are passing. Like total expenditure of any any customer or I want to retrieve a list of Customers whose age is more than 60 year or whose age is in between 40 to 60 year. OK, so here from date and to date is again filter condition. OK, if I want to pass any kind of filter condition, then we'll use query parameter. So mostly like people are getting confused between query parameter and URI parameter. OK, so for URI parameter here also we are passing filter condition only, but that filter condition will be unique. OK, it's not like from date. Like. Retrieve all the customer whose age is more than 60 year. Here age is more than 60 years, so we will get a list of customer. We will get multiple customer. But if I have filter condition like I want to retrieve a customer whose customer ID is this. So using that customer ID, we will have only one customer. That customer ID also we are using for filtering purpose only, but that customer ID is a unique ID for each customer. 
So if we are passing any unique identifier, then you we then we use URI parameter. Okay. And if we are passing any processing data, let's say I want to register a customer. So I want to pass customer name, address, email, phone number, customer ID, all those kind of data I want to pass. So these all are processing data. So we will pass inside body or payload. Okay, hope everyone clear with this. If anyone has any doubt, let me know. And this one is very important part. So based on the requirement, you need to understand what kind of data we will pass at which place. I hope it's clear for everyone. So, so you can see here we have message ID, client ID, client secret. All these are these are not actual data, not processing data, neither filter condition. These all are supporting data which support our actual data or filter condition. So that's why these all are headers. You can see here in URI parameter at this moment I haven't given anything. But this one is for retrieve customer, so we can pass customer ID here. OK, so this customer ID will be URI parameter since we are using this as a unique identifier. OK, then we have query parameters. So if we want to do anything filtering, OK, let's say for this particular API, we have multiple, it support multiple features. OK, so like uh, this support multiple feature, anything I'm taking example. OK, so if we, we take that as a filter condition, then we will pass in query parameter. And here we are doing get operation. So in get operation, get operation, we don't pass any data inside body. OK, but in response, we will get some response. So here you can see we have defined many fields in response. OK, so in response, we have multiple fields. Which we need to define inside response based on your API detail. OK, then. Here I have given one JSON payload also. Now, at the end I have given one like uh, this. This all are non-functional requirement. Okay. So what is here? What kind of processing type we have? This kind of what kind of API is this one? This one is real-time REST API, this one is scheduler-based API, this one is event-driven API. So there are like in interview, they may like you may encounter this kind of problem, like what integration pattern you are following. Okay, so in integration pattern, we have many kind of patterns, like uh, you can develop REST API, you can develop SOAP API, you can develop event-driven API, you can develop scheduler API. Okay, so many, many kind of API we can develop. So this one is, we are going to expose this API as a REST API. So this is real-time REST API. And why real-time API? So whenever like there will be any call, immediately within two, three seconds, like that uh, API will respond with data. Okay. So this kind of API is known as real-time API. Okay. If you have any API, let's say uh, there is a Salesforce system where someone is, will insert data and you will have any scheduler API 
which will run once in a day. It will fetch all the data from Salesforce and it will like uh, insert that data into database. So those kind of API is known as scheduler based API. Okay, again we have like event driven API. Let's say we have a database. If there will be any re new record in database or if someone will update any existing record in database, then event will be created in database and your mule API will be triggered and that API will consume data from database and it will send to target system. So those kind of API is known as event driven API. Okay. So we have multiple. So this one is REST API, then frequency. For REST API, there will not be any kind of frequency. Once user will call, client will call, then this API will be consumed. Okay. Then method, what uh, initiation method, this will be push for. So this will be again like API call. So not applicable here. Data size, what will be data size here? So you can see like only we are passing query parameter, one URI parameter and some header. So it will be like uh, 0 0.5 KB or something like that. Okay. Then daily volume. So like if for each API, there should be some TPS. Okay. So there may be some API which will be very frequently called. There will be some API which will be rest, uh, like less frequently called. Let's say, let's say like we have one API where we are retrieving any Okay, in retail domain only I'm discussing. Let's say we have one uh, API to retrieve a list of item. Okay. And we have another API to register a customer. So as per like your understanding, which API will be called very frequently? Retrieve item detail or create customer, which API will be frequently consumed, frequently called. So definitely like once there will be Thousand, ten thousand users. So they will keep uh, uh, like uh, logging in website and they will keep calling this retrieve customer, retrieve item detail API. Okay. So frequency will be very high compared to registration. Okay. In, in a day maximum, there will be 500 registration or 1000 registration. But we have 10,000 or 20,000 customer. So they will keep logging, they will keep retrieving item details. So that API will be called very frequently. Okay. And for those kind of API, like where we have very huge amount of data in response. So we we need to do pagination and all that is separate thing. Okay. But uh, like we should not retrieve all the data at a time. Otherwise, your network latency will be very slow and uh, you will your your page will take too much time to load. So in that those kind of scenario, we need to do pagination and all. Okay. So again, if we will do pagination, means we are calling that API again and again. So TPS will keep increasing. So TPS generally means how many transactions we are doing per second. 20 TPS means in a second, that API will be called 20 times. Okay. So this can be transaction per second or thread per second, how many threads are getting initiated. Ravi, can you please explain pagination again? Okay, so pagination concept is very important whenever you are dealing with any API which is returning very huge amount of data. Okay, let's say you have retrieved item detail API. Okay, or you can say product detail API. So for any company like a company like Amazon and all, they have like 10,000 or 1,000 product for a particular category. Okay, if you are calling that API, Let's say you are uh, like uh, calling for uh, men's product. You are calling their API with uh, filter men, and then you are retrieving all the men's product. Okay, so there may be like ten thousand products also maybe there. If you will return, if that API will return all the ten thousand uh, product detail or maybe one thousand also, one thousand product detail, then there will be huge amount of data transfer. Okay, for one product, you will get product name, ID, price, stock, everything you will get. Okay, and for example, one one item has one KB data. So if it is 10,000 items, 10,000 KB data means it will be very huge data. And if that data will be transferred on internet, it will take some time. 
to process. Okay, so as a user, you will not get very real time experience. Like once you will call that API, you will wait for five second, ten second, then page will start loading. Okay, then page will load means with the, those product data. So as a user nowadays, like people don't want to wait for one second. Also, if they are clicking on any page, they want response in one second or two second. If you are not giving response in one second, two second, then user like your user for for your particular application, your user experience will not be good. Okay, so in that case, what we can do, we can do pagination here. So what we will do, so once someone will call that API, okay, we will page the data from like uh, any database or Salesforce wherever we have target system. We will page that data. And instead of responding all the data at a time, what we will do, we will ask front end to pass page size and offset. Or, or you can say page number and page size. Okay. So front end side also, they know here we will get lots of data. Okay. So that, that should be like mutual communication between API team and front end team. They know for this API, there will be thousands of data. So they have integrated like implemented pagination concept in API side. So what they will do every time they will pass page number and page size. Let's say uh, we we agreed on page size of 100. Then what they will do first they will pass page number as a one and page size equals to 100. So we will call that API like a backend system. Okay, we will get the data. So in pagination like there can be in two way. Pagination will also be like uh, two way. One is every time you are calling that backend system, and another way you are calling one time only that backend system, and we are storing that data inside our cache. Okay, from second request and all, you will not call that backend system again and again. So all those things depends on requirement and what kind of system you are integrating. Here I am assuming uh, like our system target system is database. And that data will not change very frequently. So what I will do in first request when I got page size equals to 100, page number equals to one, I call database and I got from database I got 5000 record. Okay, what I did, I cached all the 5000 record and at in the first request where I got page number one and page size 100, I sent one to 100 data means one to 99 data. Or one to hundred, it will yes one to hundred. Okay, now front end will get hundred record first. They will display that hundred record. Okay, so customer will not see all the hundred record at a time. They will keep scrolling the page. Okay, they see ten item, twenty item, thirty item, and they are scrolling the page till that point they got hundred and he is scrolling the page. Now front end will immediately call that API again with page number two. And this uh, again uh, page size or offset value equals to 100. Now this time, I know like uh, he passed uh, this uh, page number two. So what I will do, I, like on the API side, we will do calculation. Okay, so means first time we sent 100 record. Now we will send from 101 to 200. So we will reply that 101 to 200 records detail. Now he reached by scrolling. He took two second to scroll till all the 100 item. And within that time only we replied with next 100 record. Now front end will keep displaying next 100 record. OK, so in this way, with the help of this pagination concept, we can give some uh, better user experience to customer. Is it clear? Yes, yes, thanks. This is done through the URI. Uh, Vinak, your voice is not clear. For me, uh, this is uh, the pagination is done through your uh, resource URL. Resource URL. No, not resource URL. You need to pass uh, like page size and offset value from front end. They will pass their those two value on and API side. We need to apply that logic how this pagination will work. Okay. 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 And many times, like backend system also support pagination. Okay, so it's not like uh, every time on API side need, you need to handle. Again, 
API side also we have limitation. If your data is too big, then don't do pagination on API side. OK, otherwise your cache like uh, that cache memory will get full uh, filled. OK. So first of all, whenever you are doing cache, then on API side, then you need to be like very clear that uh, data is not very frequently changing that data and uh, you can like uh, you should able to cache that data okay and that uh, still data size should not be too high also otherwise your heap memory will be filled by that those data only okay so many many target system also support pagination like salesforce database they they all support pagination okay then in that case what you will do you will just pass pass through that uh, offset value or page size or page number okay next we have hour of operation so as we discussed like this is real time api so it should be available for 24 hours okay then sla so what will be response time for this particular api okay sla means it doesn't means your api will take 3 second every time it may take 500 millisecond also 600 millisecond also but it should not take more than three seconds. If you are, your API is taking, you are giving SLA as a three second. Or out of one lakh request, if one request is also crossing that three second, means you, your API is breaching that, breaching that SLA. SLA means like none of the API calls should breach or should take more than that particular time. Even if like 1000 or one lakh call is there. OK, and another thing like TPS also we mentioned, OK, if it is 20 TPS, then three second SLA is there. Now they will start calling 40 TPS, then definitely it will take more than uh, three seconds. Since we have capacity to handle 20 requests in a second and you are passing 40 sec 40 like uh, transaction in a second, then definitely our resource will not able to handle those many requests and we will breach the SLA. But if they are calling 20 TPS and we are taking more than three seconds, then we are breaching the SLA. Yes, Harsit, go ahead. So regarding this TPS and SLA, uh, my first question is that how are these calculated? Since we haven't develop, developed the API yet, so how can we calculate this? And second thing is when the API is developed, how we will test this? Okay. So first thing TPS should come from BA people. Okay, they will tell you, okay, I want this many TPS. Okay, based on that, you need to calculate how many V code you will provide to that API. Okay, business will whenever business will come, they know like which API will be called very frequently, which all functionality will be very frequently used, which all functionality will be very rarely used. Okay, so that as a developer, we don't know. We means uh, we should know, but uh, as a developer, we are not responsible for that part. Since that part is a part of like business analysting, they need to give this kind of information like how frequently this API will be called, okay, and how many consumers will be there, concurrent consumer will be there. So TPS they will provide business analyst, okay, and SLA you need to provide as a developer. Uh, like once you will get the requirement, you will create this API like architect okay so let's say you are architect so you you understood when you will create this document before creating this document you will get all the requirement from ba or uh, your client okay based on that only you will create that document you know okay here we are going to call one salesforce object okay and from there we are going to get one simple payload okay and and like a tps is also not too high so like our API can respond within 2.2 second maximum. OK, and we'll take some buffer also and based on that we'll give OK, this will be our SLA. And uh, suppose we have developed the APIs, then we, we will test this by uh, by JMeter, right? OK, so yes, uh, using JMeter, you can do performance testing and all. Yes. Okay, okay. 
find them. So in this way, we need to create this uh, requirement document. So better to have this very detailed document. Otherwise, like a developer will keep calling you, keep asking you multiple things instead of uh, like uh, spending too much time to reply those to those developer. You should create very detailed document and uh, things should be very clear. OK, so like uh, there may be other format also, but this format is also good where we have given all those things in very detailed way. OK, a part of this we have some common thing also. So after that there will be multiple API involved in this functional requirement. So all this API detail will be there and after that we will have some common thing. So common thing for all the API will be. Error handling. OK, so what kind of error handling you are going to do for this API? So common error handling, you need to define it here like uh, for what will happen in, in case of bad request. So in case of bad request, we will send this kind of payload with 400 status code. In case of unauthorized like uh, 401 like uh, unauthorized, we will send status code 401 and we will send this kind of payload. Payload structure will be this. In case of like uh, not found, like uh, API not found or resource not found, we will send 401 and structure will be like this. Okay. So in this way, like uh, we will define this error handling. Then if you have something audit one that you can define here, then performance requirement like uh, SLA and all you can add here also. We did in non-functional requirement also, and you can provide here also. Then here functional testing. So you need to write all the test script. Uh, script means like what all. Like uh, you can say testing scenario you are going to cover that you need to mention here. OK, what all API you, 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 you are going to test, what all functionality you are going to test. All those things you need to mention. Other things are just uh, like a uh, reference document and other details are there, which is not very much useful, but yeah, we have this detail. Okay, so we are we are done with this uh, functional design document, uh, like uh, this definition and like how we will create. If anyone has any doubt, let me.